Right. Yep. Uh, do I have to use the mic for those on the No, the job will be All right. Okay. okay. Hi, all. Good afternoon. Um, so welcome to the first colloquium of the year 2021 2022. And most importantly, our first hybrid colloquium with an in person component first in-person component since the last one and a half year. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Ilva Yotberg. Uh, Ilva did her PhD in Amsterdam, and I've had the pleasure to have her as my office mate and a close friend since. During her PhD, she dealt with ionizing spectra of strip stars and started her journey there, also modeling uh, unifying models for different kinds of stars, such as massive stars, Wolfright stars and published very impactful papers related to strip stars as their contribution overall to uh, stars population uh, and then cosmic ionization. Um, in 2009, Eva joined as Alfred E. Nash theoretical postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie and has since been uh, transitioning slowly to also becoming an observational astronomer, focusing on searching for more of these strip stars. Last year, Eva won the NHFB fellowship uh, and has also brought that to Carnegie and continued her exploration and found some really amazing population of strip stars in FMC and LMC, which we will hear about today. Her other interest also lies in gravitational wave progenitor populations. So if some of you want to talk to her about that, please also have thoughts tomorrow. Uh, so Eva, uh, please take over. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Andrita, and thank you so much for inviting me to come for a colloquium. I'm very happy to be here and meet you all also virtually. Um, so yes, today I will talk about interacting binary. And you can see in the background of the slide, 
uh, an artist impression, I thought, but um, of how the uh, stars can interact with binaries. And you can see some really um, dramatic changes happening to these stars where material is flowing from one star to the other. So this is known as mass transfer, and we'll uh, show you a little bit more about that. Okay, so this is a chart showing you how NASA uh, on their official website depicts how stars evolve, massive stars evolve. So it starts as a protostar evolving to blue star that eventually can become a red supergiant or a stable supergiant and then become a compact object such as the neutron star. This is a picture for single stellar evolution. And um, it, it may be considered uh, even a bit too simplified, in some cases, even wrong, given that most massive stars evolve in binary. The picture changes if you include binary interaction. Uh -oh. This is a um, simplified diagram. I was not planning to go into detail here because, as you can see, there is a lot of uh, a lot of interactions happening. My main point with showing this is that the picture in reality is kind of different. So let's look at the fraction of stars that are in binary. This figure is from a paper from Max Moe and uh, Rosandi Stefano in 2017, where they synthesized work for different types of binaries from low mass to high mass to understand what fraction of stars are in so close binaries that uh, the stars would interact throughout their lifetime. So on the y-axis, we basically have the fraction of stars that in will interact through their lifetime. And on the x axis, the mass of the most massive stars. So, for example, we have a solar type star here. And even though about 50% of them are in binary, about 15% will interact with their binary companions. It seems quite a lot. Imagine how much, uh, how much low mass stars we have on the solar type star. This practice increases dramatically with initial mass of the most massive star. And you can see for about the 10 solar mass stars, 75% of them should interact with the companion. For uh, 20, 30 solar mass stars, a typical O star, uh, about 100% should interact. Okay, so the picture of massive stars evolving as single in that case may be regarded as uh, insufficient. So, what happens? What is really binary interaction? What do I mean when I say binary interaction? This pie chart is created from using samples of uh, massive stars in galactic clusters and uh, monitoring how uh, close are binary to understand uh, what is going to occur in this cluster. So you can see that about 30% of the stars are going to lose their envelope through mass transfer, leaving that helium core exposed. About 14% will accrete material. Now here. You may be, oh, why is that not the same size of the pie chart? Uh, this is something I like to clarify because it just has to do with that. Uh, in this sample, there is O type stars. So some O type stars don't have O type companions, but B has like companions, and lower mass companions. And therefore, it's that uh, P is smaller. And of course, the rest of the stars merge. I mean, this is maybe the most dramatic of that. No? The two stars melt together uh, to one. What, what can happen? What does this mean? It can create a lot of different uh, effects that affect different parts of astrophysics. For example, strip them below the supernovae, you can create that, X ray binaries, or uh, magnetic fields, or even these uh, cylindrical objects where you swallow a neutron star or black hole in, in the envelope of red supernovae. So uh, I will not go into detail of all of those, but that was mainly to show you that there's a lot of things that can occur. This uh, is an example, actually an observed example of an interactive binary. This is Beta Lyra. And these uh, observations were taken on the Chara array. So let's see if I know no, this way. It's, uh, it's up at Mount Wilson, Chara array. So it's actually really nearby. Yeah, and um, this is a beta layer. Beta layer consists of um, three solar mass donor stars. It's the dark star here, and there are 13 solar mass accretion stars. And you can see that the dark star is deformed. It is deformed into a drop-like shape. So this star is currently undergoing mass transfer. 
It is not yet completely stripped of the envelope, but we can see ongoing mass transfer in this picture. This is another example of an interesting binary, VSTS352, not as easily uh, easy to grasp what's happening here. But what you are seeing on the top is a brightness variability, a really smooth curve. And on the bottom, you can see a velocity variability of two components, one going in one direction and the other in the other direction. Because these variabilities are so smooth uh, and the brightness of these stars, the people uh, Almeida et al. could find that this is actually an overcompact binary, a massive overcompact binary. Two 30 solar mass stars sharing about 30% of the mass in the in middle of the peanut shape. So uh, this has been found before, but in low mass systems, called W mass systems. But this is also a type of interacting binary that could be interesting, for example, for the creation of double black holes through mixing induced by rotation. Uh, but so let's go back to this figure. Today, I was going to focus on this part, envelope stripping and the resulting strip stars. The strip stars can be interesting for many different things. Here is a, a pattern uh, that shows you the distribution of core plus supernovae. What type uh, are the core plus supernovae? You don't have to know the type here. I made a circle. These are uh, strip, strip envelope supernovae here. It's about 30% of the core collapse supernovae are strip envelope supernovae. What does it mean? It means that they are hydrogen poor. You don't see hydrogen in the explosion, or you see very little of hydrogen in, in the explosion. So uh, it, it reminds very much no, of, of this little pie chart, that about a third of massive stars should become strip of the envelope. So when that core later explodes, the, the theory is that that creates a envelope supernovae and it's responsible for most of those strict envelope supernovae. It's also interesting for this kind of creation of a double complex object that mirrors. So I'm sure you're familiar with this, but I'm not going to go super much into detail. But uh, you can see that we have two stages of strict stars. So both stars are going to be stripped in this system. The first one, through rupture of overflow, the one we call in the data. The second one, through the ejection of the bottom end. Actually, so you can see this leads to the merger of the compact object. Standard uh, evolution, uh, formation channel of merging neutron stars. But actually, there is a stage here where the star itself can uh, emit gravitational waves. Uh, and this I did a project on that I'm not going to super much focus on today. So, but I wanted to mention during this stage, the stars can radiate gravitational waves that are uh, detectable in the light in this And so, if we, for example, would find a such system uh, in the galaxy with neutron star companions or black hole companions, they may be detectable by you. Now, the talk was called from theory to observation. So I give a little background, so let's go into some theory. I chose today to focus on uh, ionizing radiation and the importance of ionizing radiation. So I, I mean, the ground, we're in the base, basis. I'm a theorist. I do modeling of the evolution of binary stars and the spectra of the products. So in, I do MESA, I use MESA to model the structure of, uh, of stars, and they also include binary interaction. And for the atmosphere or spectrum, I use what they call oxymetrin, non FE radiation. But just so that we are all at the same page, what is really a strict star, let's look at this little video. It's really much better to have a real audience because. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so what did we just see? We saw that the most massive star in the system it, uh, evolved first. It tried to become a red supergiant. But then there was a second star too nearby that ripped off all of that hydrogen envelope 
leaving a hot and compact helium core spot. It's the blue star here, blue star circle. Okay, how does it look like in a more, uh, maybe, what to say, um, a professional model? <laughs> here we can see a celebrity model of a single star. In the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, so you should see temperature of the surface on the x axis in the reverse direction and luminosity on the y axis. This twice solar of a single star it develops uh, towards redder, cooler temperature that eventually explodes as a type 2 supernova or hydrogen rich supernova. If this star gets stripped, the picture changes completely. Uh, complete you can see that the track changes direction, it moves into the high temperature region. But eventually, it's going to probably explode as a 1b supernova or a hydrogen free helium rich supernova. The background, oh yeah, I'm not the first one to have done this, of course. So, the, I wanted to show you some really old simulations done here in the Gustin group in 1957. These are these photos from 1957. In 57, they were still doing single stars. But in 67, they moved on to binaries. So this, I would say, is the third of the third star models where it has a good, uh, good evolutionary track, actually. So you can see Pachinski here in 67, so I didn't really manage to evolve the, the, the structure of the star afterwards. And you know something in 73, also, this can be similar. These tracks here are from Eldridge collaborators, and here you can see that it's now the same groups. So let's go back to what I wanted to say before. Yeah, so here the blue is showing you the fraction of the emitted flux that is ionizing. And so before this single 12 solar mass star was pretty lousy uh, source of ionizing photons, right? It never really reached into that blue part of the HR diagram. But when it's stripped, it does. So uh, the color of the track is showing you the central helium abundance. So you can basically see the long lasting stages of the solar evolution. The main sequence, how the helium abundance increases, and the uh, helium core burning over here. There. That's the long lasting stage when the star is very hot. And so, oh, yeah. No. Yeah, so this is the best you can do if um, you want to understand the spectrum of the star using only a stellar evolution model. This is a blank curve. You can see the wavelength here, the flux and the y-axis. It is really smooth. So I felt if I want to understand how exactly how much ionizing photons we stars contribute with, we need something probably a little bit better than that, or at least check whether the, um, the prediction for the ionizing flux is realistic. So I made a spectrum model, um, and it looks something like this. So here you can see a lot more detail. You can see spectral lines, but maybe something that is really quite dramatic is this jump over here. But it, it's uh, really uh, significant for the helium plus ionizing photon. So this is the edge for helium plus ionizing photon, helium one, and hydrogen ionizing photon. But um, so in total, this star emits about 83% of its flux as hydrogen ionizing photons. It is actually quite a good com um, uh, comparison with uh, the plant curve in the end, it turned out, but it, it, it is not working for the blue curve. That is good to know. So you can use the spectrum model, this emission rate of ionizing photons for a a range of, of mass of these three stars and combine it into um, a population prediction to understand how much these three stars could contribute to the ionizing mission of the star population. So this is a prediction for the hydrogen ionizing mission this from the y-axis of the stellar population and starboard, a function of time after the star. In, in green, you can see the contribution from single stars. So, First, there is quite high rate, in this is a low scale here, but after about 3 million years, because the most massive stars die, this drops really rapidly. If you include the strip stars, it looks like this. So they have a, a lower highest 
emission rate, but they really contribute to the books at later time. So an order of magnitude to several order of magnitude increase in ionizing photons at uh, 10 to 100 million years after starburst. And so that, that can really change uh, how such, for example, very speed, small star from the galaxy can affect. So let's look at the spectral energy distribution. Yeah, yeah. so at 20 million years, this is how the spectral energy distribution is set. We have wavelengths and flux. And in green, that's a single star in non interacting environment. And in blue, that's the contribution from the spectral. So you can see that they not only contribute to much more ionizing photons, but they also have much harder ionizing radiation than the massive stars. So uh, they, for example, could give rise to a completely different level of spectrum if you look at, for example, the nebula of uh, this kind of galaxy uh, with a harder ionized, uh, high, more highly ionized element, for example, available in the spectrum. So, so we used this in collaboration with two students from uh, Princeton in, and convolved it with um, uh, a cosmological simulation uh, where galaxies, they identify galaxies at uh, redshift seven in this cosmological simulation to understand how, um, how much their uh, ionizing flux uh, change. And so here we have, I, I took the liberty of uh, uh, correlating the virial mass with the helium mass and sort of the stellar mass. Huh? And uh, so from the y axis, the ionizing emission. So as you see in, in purple, is the trend for if you only include single stars. And in green, is the trend if you include the two stars. Doesn't do super much for high mass systems, huh? but at the low mass system, you can get an increase of the emission rate of the orders of mass. And uh, this Elizabeth, so Amy did this first work, and Elizabeth was also checking how, whether they may be potentially uh, detectable by the scale of your feet. So this part here, yes, that's really far. Uh, after a chip seven may be detectable. So it's not so much, but this cosmological simulation was only considered down to the chip seven. Imagine, for example, redshift five, how that would look like how much is the capability. You can also think of this ionizing contribution as potentially contributing to cosmic ionization. So if you think of a stellar population, chip stars contribute about 5% of the ionizing emission and massive stars about 95%. This looks really little. But if you account for the fact that strip stars are created with a delay after a burst of star formation, and the surrounding bird cloud has often dispersed by supernova, a supernova explosion or so, they should have a larger fraction of their emitted stars that can reach into the intergalactic medium and perform the fireworks. So, we made a simple model for this. And we found that maybe tens of percent of the ionizing photons uh, uh, that cause cosmic reanimation could have come from the chip stars. So let's look a little closer at that. Here is a function of redshift. Now we have composed this emission rate of ionizing photons with the cosmic star emission rate. So we see a function of redshift. Basically, this is just the a fraction, the amount of um, ionizing photons that reach into the intergalactic medium. But early redshift, the massive stars, they contribute a lot. But with uh, lower and lower redshift, the two stars' contribution increases. And around uh, redshift 7 or so, the contribution is made 10 to 20 So if we look at, uh, for example, when cosmic redshift stations could have occurred, this is the model where we balance the emission rate of ionizing photons with uh, the amount of nuclear hydrogen and the recombination of uh, ionizing hydrogen. And here, if you have single star, it, it uh, causes cosmic ionization around 30 something. But if you include the first star, it occurred about 100 million years earlier. So the redshift here is the size of A and this one. 
So this can matter. And now it's a rough model because you need to better understand exactly what fraction can reach the intergalactic medium and not. Uh, but it, it's at least indicative that this could have been important and highlight the importance of better understanding what uh, interesting binaries there could be uh, in the early universe and at low metrics. So you remember this picture, the theory, in theory, about a third of all massive stars should be considered. This, um, this is an argument of published church stars. So we have one intermediate mass church star now. It is called HP4516 or the Poisano, sorry, a star of HP4516. The four solar mass strip star that orbit about the size of a mass B type star. If we allow also beta Lyra, who is a mass transferring binary, and maybe Upsilon to be higher, it's a key to, to join this if we have three stars. So I would say that we have a bit of a um, contrast between theory and operation. So what's going on? Is this a paradox? Are we missing all the trick stuff? So this question is what um, sparked my interest, former postdoc, and um, it's leading into the, uh, my favorite topic of this talk, which is the observation and the searching of the trick stuff. So let's look at the, um, this is kind of diagram where we can see the mass of the strip star on the axis and the mass of the companion star on the y axis and try to map out what do we know. So I mentioned intermediate mass strip stars, but there, there is a lower mass strip star than the So we, we have a lot of sub dwarfs. Sub dwarfs are low mass strip stars or thin dwarfs, white dwarfs. There is a better direct link there. Then we have two probably inflated strip stars, low mass one ish. Then we have that one, the quasar for your star. And then we know what for your stars, right? They are also helium stars, they are also both core of mass. But what with all the most of the progenitors of strip envelope supernovae or binary neutron star or neutron star black hole mergers, where where are they? Why we haven't time to count those yet? Um, so uh, we can make some predictions for how many should exist. Maybe they are just there. Maybe maybe their lifetime is too short. So this is again from that population model I showed you with the ionic stuff. What's the number after starburst of about ten um, about a million solar masses? You can see that the three stars are the one with the age, and the evolutionary time scale of this. Progenitor. And uh, for this starburst, for example, we can compare it to clusters. So, in clusters of like 10 to the 5 solar masses or so, um, intermediate age, it should have a um, few to 10 ish solar uh, or strip stars. Not that much. So, it can be, it can be hard to find. But if we look here at the continuous star formation, for example, a, quite a big galaxy. Uh, we can estimate how many should there be. So, uh, in the Milky Way, assuming a star formation rate of about one solar mass per year, there should be about 3,000 explodable strip stars. So, 1,000. No? In the LSD and SSC, assuming a certain lower star formation rate, we should have 100 of explodable strip stars. So, so, this should be abundant. We should be able to find this. Uh, so what should we look for? How do they look like? So the strip stars are hot, 30 to 100,000 uh, Kelvin, really small, less than a solar radius. And they cover a range of luminosities, just dependent on the, the mass. And they, can, they are helium rich, of course, and hydrogen four because they are the exposed. So, so, so some people may say, you know, that's a, that's a wolf eye star, I know. And the other ones may say, no, no, that's a dwarf. Hmm? But um, I would say probably none of them are wrong. This is just different parts of the mass spectrum of helium stars. The low mass end, we have the sub dwarfs, and at the high mass end, we have the Wolfria stars. So, in between here, that's the right range we're really looking at two to ten ish solar masses. Um, this is some spectral models that can hopefully help to understand how these stars would look like. So, you can see this is for a full mass range from sub dwarfs up to Wolfria stars. 
most of them should be really UV bright, right? If they make sense, they are really hot and complex. Um, and they should also meet a, a large fraction of high energy. If we look at, oh yeah, interesting one, yes. If we look at the optical spectrum, we might get some clues as well how, how the opt optical spectrum should look like. So here we can see, sorry for the part here. Here you can see um, at the low map end here, subwork have absorption line spectra. And at the high map end, have emission type spectra, this is what I guess are. In between, there is a transitional spectra class expected where you have both absorption features and emission features. There's a kind of bridge just signifying that the wind mass loss is increasing so that you can see this wind emission feature. Emission feature for, for the wind. This is something that has been found. Uh, for example, this is a star from the large Magellanic cloud. In it, part, it was found as part of a survey using narrowband photometry of seeing uh, this line. Um, and they thought uh, we were looking for Wolf I guess that from this star. I was saying, hmm, what is this? So you can see the absorption features, they are typical to an O3 type massive star. And the emission features are typical to a WM3 type Wolf I guess star. So they chose to call this WM3 slash O3 star. Now, it cannot be a binary of those two components. So that, that's the obvious part, you know, we just see the absorption feature from the O star and the emission feature from the W star. No, because this star is way too faint for hosting an O3 type star. O3 type stars are really high mass, 60 solar masses more, and would be much brighter than these objects. So I just, I got tempted. I made an overlay in front of my model. Uh, and we can see that at least, even though this is not the spectral model, the absorption lines are in the right phase and the emission lines are in the right phase. So this could signify that this star is um, a helium rich star with uh, some intermediate mass, intermediate wind mass loss rate. Now, whether it's a strip star or not through a binary interaction, it needs to be confirmed to be binary to know that for sure. And this has not been done yet. So. That's something that I just thought would be something So let's fill them in. Yeah. So the W3 or 3 stars are probably like 10 to 20, so maybe even 10 to 15. They are a little bit bright. Okay. Then. then I wanted to mention some more work that I think is really interesting from this year. It was done by Lu Chang Wang. Lu Chang was looking at uh, the E type spectra. She was going through archival UV uh, spectroscopy. And uh, she, she found this spectrum of the star, for example, and she uh, cross correlated with a uh, hot, hot star spectrum and a BE star spectrum and could identify a, a BE star and a hot star. And the hot star flux contribution is really small, just a few percent. So that indicates that the, this hot star, about 50,000 50, Kelvin ish, is probably a low mass red star, a subwarf of one solar mass or less, orbiting a quite high mass star, 8 to 15,000. And this, I think, is really cool because that means that mass transfer happening in the future must have been quite conservative. And whether mass transfer is conservative or not, we, we don't have very good constraints on this yet. So this could be one of the first uh, constraints for uh, conservative mass transfer. So these, in this case, it's like mass transfer can be conservative. She also could measure the motion. So you can see that the, the star is moving. So this is the piece of the star acceptance part of it. It's possible. It's, um, also has a radial velocity consistent with the low mass the component. And when you put them in the person Russell diagram, indeed it seems to be correlated with about 0.5 solar mass uh, to one solar mass that just starts to work. And um, the masses there are for the initial star. So um, and I know that these, these masses are the mass of the subject. 
So what is the maximum one? Okay, so let's put them in. So they are up there. So we're filling in, but we still don't have anything there. So that's when we come to the main topic. This is a survey of stars strict in binaries in the Magellan Cloud. So they started about two years ago with Maria Duff and the student Anthony Gadri at the Toronto. And when we started to look for these intermediate mass strip stars, the main progenitors of strip envelope supernovae or um, uh, yeah, binary mass converge. So how does it work? How did we find these? It's based on the method uh, we call UTXS. So what you can see here is the spectral energy distribution of the strip star, the model of the strip star. And if you would add a companion star to to this, so maybe a five solar mass companion here with four solar mass strip stars. In optical, it might be hard to see a difference. You can see the slope is very similar. But in the ultraviolet, the strip star is completely dominated. So if you compare these two, you may be able to separate out UV bright stars from uh, main super stars. So if we look at the polar magnitude diagram here, maybe uh, UV flux, UV brightness on the y axis, UV color, we have UV bright here and the same there. This is how single stars evolve with the zero aging sequence shown there. This is where we expect strip stars to end up. And um, if you couple one of the two, like in that example, they should end up together. And you can make many kind of combinations and they will end up in between or overlapping with the main sequence, depending on what's the mass of the companion, how bright it is. We find three different types here, some examples where you have either a low mass companion and the high mass strip star. Some immediate as before, and maybe some situation where uh, the companion is brighter than the star. And these uh, result in three types of spectral morphologies that we expect to find. Something looking like a single strip star, this way, something looking where you can see both uh, um, signatures of the companion and of the strip star, and something where it basically looks like a B star. And you don't really see any contribution from the strip star. And this, I should say, is the optical spectrum. So we decided to call the isolated, composite, and deep type. And it, I should mention, just because it's an isolated group, it doesn't mean that it's isolated. It just means we cannot see the companion. Could be compact, could be very low mass. And so looking again right here, you can see that the the isolated one should be the bluest, and then uh, subsequently red. We can fill in this diagram to where we expect different types. And it is correlated to the flux contribution. So if the strip star contributes about uh, 60%, I think, yes, 80% or more of the optical flux, it is between 20 and 80, it is very composite, it is less than 20, looks like a bit and the, the picture is different if you look in the ultraviolet. So if we would have access to UV spectra, we'd just be able to see strips out all the time, which would be excellent, but we don't have that. So uh, if we look at uh, what masses this technique is sensitive to, so here is the grid where you can see the mass of the companion star on the y-axis and mass of the strip star on the x-axis. And so we would be able to see, um, let's see, let's go over that here, there. That's the main difference over that. So we would be able to see primarily uh, low mass companions, lower than six solar masses. So in that sense, we are not really sensitive to those systems of Lucham, for example, that have really higher mass than low mass, so more large um, mass um, difference. And also, uh, this suggests that we have we are sensitive to non-conservative mass transfer or common envelope ejection systems. So it's really kind of complementary. But in the higher mass region. So, oops, is it coming in? So, we use two sets of data, archival data, to do this. This is a, a photometric catalog optical um, by Faristin collaborators. It has a magnitude limit of about 20 and spatial resolution of about one arc second. And this is the UV catalog we use from CEO, the UVOX with data. 
the UV um, magnitude range is about 18, much worse spa spatial resolution of about 2.5 arcseconds. And this I want to highlight Bethany's work for uh, making a good job. It's really important that we can uh, distinguish the, uh, the UV flux, and I will show you why. This is one of my favorite stars. I will refer to it as star number seven. If you're um, and this is an optical image. No? So it's, it's pretty nice. No? You can see the different stars, following your spectrograph on me, the shape. But this is how it looks in the UV. So here we can see some issue, right? That probably two sources. How do you know what flux comes from what star? How do you separate that? So what Bethany has been working on is um, forward modeling techniques with um, a, a package called the tracker to be able to better determine what's the UV flux from these images and make a, a, a reliable catalog of UV bright process, sources in the Virgin Islands. So there's really a crowding issue going on. And so with better spatial resolution, that would be so much easier. So this is the theoretical operation. Let's look at the data. This is the computer data catalog where the large and small Magellan clouds. Here is the zero H main sequence. And now we have cleaned this super much. So there's in reality many more stars, but this is the photometry only that we're referring to. Here are some more earlier stars. So you can see those W and three or three stars also in the NMC. That's where the the smaller star prediction strips are actually like. And this is a sample that we believe contains strip stars. And these are the ones that we decided to look at with spectroscopy to confer confer that they are strip stars. So how do we do that? So at Carnegie, I have uh, the available supply for type the Magellan telescope. So we use the main spectrograph at uh, Magellan Barnet. It's about a 4,000 spectral resolution. The wavelength range is up to about 3,700 to 7,000. And then um, we get a spectra with enough noise ratio between 30 to 100. It depends on how many of these we do. And uh, so, again, so it's for all those like, circles in the color spectrum. This is three stars that we found. So, this is actual data. On the top, you can see uh, one that we think is dominated by the strip star. The bottom one is dominated by the companion star, and then we have something that has a both components. So here you can see the helium two lines. They indicate high effective temperature. Helium two is ionized helium. It's a recombination line coming from um, a fully ionized helium to one ionized helium. So it requires really high temperature. You can see that in the top two spectra. The left part here the, is showing you where the strong Balmer lines should lie. So Balmer lines are expected to be really strong for B-type stars or A-type stars. The hydrogen are spectral lines. You can see that they are really very strong for this one and quite strong also in the middle spectrum, but basically not present in the top spectrum. So this is a signature of a B-star companion, so maybe it could be that those wanting to have a B star contribution. And so, um, yeah, so we have nine stars of the top half, eight stars in the middle half, and ten stars in the B half. Okay, and I want to mention a big few. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, one peculiarity is we did not find any composite clouds in the we don't know why yet. Figuring that out, it could be small numbers. And now I want to focus on showing you what the stellar property is of the stars in the isolated sample. We'll go to the stars in the isolated sample just because then we don't have to deal with the contribution from the companion star. And hopefully, in that way, we can get uh, as close uh, estimates as possible. So uh, we can look here at the spectrum. So, what did we expect? We expected the range. From South Dwarf at the bottom to Wolf Rayet Star. And as you can see, when I have more of these spectrum, we can see uh, some things that didn't happen, right? So, in comparison to the models I showed before, there's nothing really going to emission here. 
So this indicates that, um, oh yeah, so it also looks very different from that previously known strip star, the HT45156, which is here in the emission feature. That's strong emission feature, so it's a big difference. That's a galactic object, also. It's, it's different also in that sense. But the main difference I want to highlight is that these stars, they have very low wind mass loss, much lower wind mass loss rate than what the models predicted. So these must be less than 10 to minus 8 solar masses per year or something like that. And it could definitely uh, affect the future evolution of the star, whether the type of supernova, whether it interacts with gear because of the less of hydrogen or something like that. But to better constrain this in the UV spectra, so um, we were lucky to get some interesting times to try to see whether there is um, some measurable mass loss rate. But so let's look at one of these stars to show you how I make we measure the stellar uh, So uh, here we're going to look at the first the temperature, uh, the balance of ionized helium to neutral helium. For surface uh, gravity, we're going to look at one of the power features in comparison to a pure human. Oh, no, sorry, that was for the, uh, the uh, third position. And here we have one of the following features, a uh, short wave and common feature, and one of the common features for the surface structure. So if you add on top of these some models for strip stars, they can cover different parts of the planet, let's say. And if you color them, you will see that we have the separation Helium um, uh, 1 to helium 2, like that, and get the separation. There's a helium and fraction. You can see a difference depending on whether there is um, a pure helium light or a blended helium light. And the surface gravity matters whether it's a short wave or a long wave. We can overlay the model, no, the, the data. Here you can see that the data has really high surface temperature of usually more than 70,000 Kelvin. Most of them are uh, helium rich and hydrogen poor, 30% of hydrogen or less. And the surface gravity is high, about 4.8 to 5.5-ish. Uh, so that's really significantly higher than any main sequence uh, star. Um, so it's all in agreement. Let's fill in this table. Um, more than 70,000 surface uh, temperature, very high helium abundance on the surface, some close to 100%, and low P of about, uh, about five ish. So we can put this into a field diagram. If we measure this, the effective temperature, it's going to be effective. And the surface gravity on the right is going to be up there. So in our different regions, you can see main sequence stars, diamond stars, white dwarfs. Single star walls like this. This is where our sample is. So if you plot the resolution models for strip stars, they will restrict to the helium And so if we compare this sample with the evolutionary model, we find that probably two stars have masses between two and eight each solar masses and should be progenitors for supernova strip and low strip and low strip. This is some tentative work that I'm doing with spectral fitting for this stars, and um, where you can see again that they overlap in the HR diagram for stars with mass two to eight ish solar masses. And so this, this is going to come out a little bit later. So now I think that our survey is covering this probably this part of the planet of space because we cannot go to high enough for uh, then it's going to overlap with the main sequence. But we can probably cover most of those uh, with the low mass So now as a summary then. Um, so I want you to remember that um, stars that are strict in binary are expected to be uh, significant contributors of ionizing radiation, especially hard ionizing radiation, maybe at different of galaxies or even during cosmic radiation. They are probably the progenitors of strict envelope supernovae or most strict envelope supernovae. They can emit gravitational waves, so these are the emission of gravitational waves. But still, 
there have been very few of these uh, progenitor species. So in a new survey, we identified 10 of these artifacts with a mass of about two to eight solar masses. And uh, yes, yeah, so we find that observations largely agree with the theoretical models, but there is a large difference in the wind mass process, which we think is going to affect the future evolution of the star. Seems to be done. So this leads to a lot of different things that you can do. So where do we go next? Oh, now we're going to hang on. Let me remove that. Um, hmm, um, yeah, so we can do project, the precise measurements of the ion um, and measure what the, what's the impact. We'll find what the impact of the impact of binary hydrate reinforced. We must operate for potentium rich stars, so I can assure that. Uh, find constraints and gravitational weights to generate information. Find new types of X-ray binaries and complex companions. We can uh, measure, for example, with a large sample, how conservative is mass transfer and how what's the preferred way that trip stars are created? How often are common envelopes successful? And also studying the issues in the initial interior rotation rate of master stars, core structure, metallicity dependence on binary interaction. And so, luckily, I've been uh, working in a team where we have some nice contribution for some of these uh, projects, but of course, there is a lot of work to do. So, um, you can see it, it covers a large span of different types of physics from interacting binary, massive star for rotational waves, ISM and I believe, you know, galaxies and ionization. So, we, had, we started here with Beric, the audience. Working on metallic dependence in a binary interaction. Then I'm working with Ashley at UCLA. She is measuring the rotation rates of the, the, the six stars, trying to find the angular momentum transfer. Bethany has been doing great work to try to uh, figure out whether there are complex companions. We actually just got Chandra time to study what is this. And uh, Code has been doing some pulsation modeling to better understand the interior. Maria has done a lot of things. Basically, Maria is not a lot but she also got some HSP time to study the wind mass also. I would say I'm, I'm uh, involved in most of these projects. So. so, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and happy to have taken a break. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, for the wonderful talk on uh, your current research with the stars and the amazing population that we found now. Um, let's open up the questions, uh, questions now. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. And uh, if you're online, please post the questions in chat and we will be monitoring it uh, and amplifying them here. So, yeah. So I already see that in chat, there is a question from Dylan. Could strip stars extend the hydrogen and, uh, sorry, the H alpha emitting lifetime of helium 2 region beyond the typical 15 mega year expected from Starburst uh, 99? And if so, what level would the H alpha luminosity of an instantaneous Starburst that you at relative to its peak? Thank you. That's a very nice question. I'd be happy, I happy. I would have uh, been happy to go more deeply into that. I have not done any uh, nebular um, spectral modeling, which I would have loved to do to answer that properly. But I know that the ionizing emission rate is, is lower for the strip stars compared to the most massive stars in the cluster. Also, with time, you you lose quite a lot of that. Yeah, that is in H2 region. So I'm not so sure exactly how much they could affect the, um, the H alpha lifetime. It could be that it does something. There is still nebular modeling need to be done. So it could happen though, is a, pos a potentially contribution to helium 2 nebula lines, which could be quite interesting, actually, and something I would love to work on. Cool. Uh, Jim. So you mentioned that most of these should be in binary. Have you done any multi epoch spectroscopy to see if any of these are binary? Yeah. The orbital period of velocity. Yeah, we have done that. We have measured um, and controlled that all of the stars in the sample that I showed 
um, are showing uh, uh, orbital motion. Some of them we have uh, full orbital solutions for, but it's a small part of the sample. And we need to take more spectra in order to follow, uh, fully have full orbital uh, solutions for them. But some of them are really interesting. I think, for example, let's see if I can find that one. Um, this in the middle here is an SP2. And you can see how the hydrogen lines is moving in one direction and the helium ones are moving in the other direction. This one on the top here, or seven, <laughs> is uh, SP1. And this one has an orbit of maybe 40 days, but it seems to orbit something quite massive and also has a sensitive X ray detection. So that's the one that Bethany is, uh, has got a chunk of time for. So, yeah. so do you know, do you have any idea yet if most of them are in long period binaries or short period binaries? The long period ones probably went through stable mass transfer, the short period maybe went through unstable mass yeah. transfer. Let me show you. Um, okay, so from top to bottom, long period. Short period, short period, long period, short period, short period, short period. Okay, so uh, it's about um, most are in short period binary, which means days are left. And a few are in longer period binary, which means 10 days or more. So um, that's true for the isolated sample. The composite, we have, don't have enough data to say how fast they are. Moving. So I have a question actually. Yes, I'm, so, uh, I'm really curious about the thinking on you know new types of X-ray binaries. And so if you're looking at more of the shorter orbital periods there or more of the long-term transits, um, transiting binaries. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she said that there are some Chandra observations being asked for these objects. And so uh, just curious about what kind of uh, you know X-ray emission that you're looking at. Yeah, so these probably have the X-ray luminosity. So I did a really simple assumption, a smooth wind mass loss rate and, uh, in, in, for, in density decreasing in the wind and have a compact object moving through the wind. What could the luminosity, X-ray luminosity be? Mm -hmm. So this is probably between 10 to the 30, 10 to the 38-ish ergs per second. Oh, okay. And uh, since they are in the Magellanic Cloud, they are also doing the same thing. But uh, uh, it, it should be possible. So I mean, we asked for Chandra time for many, but it's not great with Chandra because Chandra has a, it's a little bit sensitive at those um, areas of the sky. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've got one star. So okay. certainly one star. Hope that we find something there. And are you also like combining data sets from new star and some of the deeper? general surveys that have already been done for these yeah. Oh, we have not done that. That okay. would be interesting to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, we spoke about um uh hydrogen script and uh medium rich stars, but uh do you at all look into um hydrogen anti-rate strip stars and where the um second point of the so are you referring to completely helium free and hydrogen free stars? So like, like really the cores of massive stars, the deep cores. Yeah. Those are also interesting. I don't think we have them in the sample, but those are definitely interesting. And people are asking me, where do they come from? How do you create the one C supernovae? Okay, that's complicated, right? Because then you need to strip these stars one more time. And probably it's not enough with doing this during the helium shell burning. So let's let's look at the HR diagram thing. Sorry, Ilva, can you repeat the question? Yes, of course I can repeat there? the question. Hang on. Or just paraphrase it. Yeah, can you bring up the HR diagram? Yeah. Okay. So the question was if um, I want to talk elaborate a little bit, I guess, about uh, the um, uh, hydrogen and helium free stars. So even deeper strips than these. And so what can happen, I think here is the moment where the mouse is great. So here is the helium core burning, where you can see the color changing. 
Over here, the helium shell ignites and the star expands because the core uh, contracts. So it could be if the binary, is, if the star is inflating sufficiently, you enter a second phase of mass transfer over here. That could happen, for example, if you have a bit more hydrogen left, which happens if the wind mass loss is lower, which I think is. So you could enter that. But that is it's, it's such a short part of the stellar evolution timescale. So you actually cannot strip off enough material during that uh, space. So you need to have mass transfer during the helium core burning phase in order to lose enough material for that. This is my suspicion, but we, I think we need to do uh, more modeling to better understand that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, Jim, I'm going to defer to some of the PhD students who have questions. Tony, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I yeah, just have a question. Um, going back to the diagram we populated for the, sorry, where you show the mass of the companion versus the mass of the crater. <laughs> Have you made like a population of that? So like evolving population from the beginning to become an HD, like the various masses. So you roughly know what to expect when you have, yeah, that one. So you roughly know what to expect from your observations. And then if your observations are sensitive to that. Because now I'm thinking if in the models you put in uh your expected higher mass loss, then you might have things that go down to lower masses, but you're finding that you have lower mass loss, and maybe you just have a lot of them. Ah, good question. So, when I talk about wind mass loss, this is uh, very low, uh, so low that um, even for the sun for, for the mass is not changing. What you change is the surface composition and the amount of depth of the or something like that. Okay. So, it's not going to change the mass of the surface. But it is interesting to make a population synthesis of this indeed. And it's something that I, I, I have a half finished project on, but so there is a lot of uncertainties. Hmm? We don't know, for example, what do we assume for mass transfer efficiency? Is all mass going to be treated or not? It seems like in Chang Huang project, it seems like yes, it should be all treated. But then we still find some long period binaries with maybe some main sequence companions in this sample. So we could possibly have two. Uh, pathways of the formation. I think observational studies can help inform how to best interpret how a binary movement should, should proceed. But even just the prediction, of course, that would be really interesting to have in, in different kinds of variations. Yeah. Okay. Jim. So, you showed that overlay between your model spectrum and the WN303 star, and it looks they look mostly similar except for the N5 line. Do you know what's going on there? You know, it's the nitrogen pie feature. <laughs> yeah, I actually know what's going on there. This is so interesting. Yeah. So when I made this model, I made this model for, um, because I thought, okay, probably the wing mass of the scheme is pretty good that we have. And so this is for a, a lower mass star. With slightly lower effective temperature. The nitrogen feature is temperature sensitive. At around 90,000 Kelvin, that flips into emission. And so this is what is about to happen in my model, but it hasn't really happened. So it's a temperature sensitivity going on. So these stars are a little bit hotter and they do better. Thanks. Thank you. So um, we are almost five minutes over the time limit. So I would like to thank you all for joining us today uh, in both virtual and uh, in-person setting. See you next week, same time. A few quick instructions. Yeah, if I still not available tomorrow, if you would like to have more discussions and you can fill up your name in the sign up sheet. And we have two more spots left for dinner today. Uh, so if you want to take a look at the sign up sheet and sign yourself up uh, for the dinner, please feel free. Uh, thanks again and see you next week. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great start.